In this uh, session, uh, we would be looking into digital filter design, uh, specifically IAR filters. Uh, there are two broad categories of digital filters, uh, finite impulse response or FIR filters and IAR filters. Uh, so getting into the details of the IAR filter design, as the name implies, it has an infinite impulse response. So if you had to uh, go back to the, uh, the block diagram of the system, uh, X input, Y output, uh, this filter coefficients, or in other words, uh, your impulse response H has infinite values. Why would we need a filter with infinite impulse response? Uh, will become obvious uh, in the next few points. Uh, but uh, looking into H, which has uh, infinite values and uh, uh, it could be written, uh, the filter expression could be written in the time domain as a convolution sum. So the output of the filter YN is nothing but the convolution sum of the input X uh, with your impulse response, or in other words, what's called filter coefficients H. Okay. So this H here, according to the definition of IAR filters, uh, could take infinite values and it could go either from minus infinity to plus infinity or from zero to infinity if you want the filter to be causal. In other words, uh, less than N, the values are zero. So it has infinite values of that and uh, this is not realizable. It's not practical. Uh, we all uh, know about it. So how do we go about in, uh, in producing an IAR filter in a more realistic way is given in the subsequent expression here. So here we are telling the filter output YN could be represented as your convolution of, of the input XN uh, with a set of coefficients A, okay, minus uh, basically taking the past values of your output y okay and convolving with uh, uh, coefficients b okay. so in other words the previously what we had as filter coefficients h is now taking uh, two forms one is a case and b case and you have to be mindful of the summation here when we are taking uh, the values of the input signal x uh, the summation goes from uh, zero k equal to zero to n okay, where uh, n is a, a duration that we are interested in getting the convolution going whereas when we take the past values of y obviously the k has to go from one to m okay, it cannot go from k equal to zero to m otherwise this equation uh, will be uh, misled okay. so the current output of the filter ym is dependent on the past m values of the output of the filter and also the past n minus one values of the input to the system. Okay. So what it essentially says is that an IAR filter, if you wanted to have in practical scenarios, uh, this forward filter doesn't work. We do have to have a, an input that's fed back through the output of the system. So there's a feedback loop involved. Okay. So when we have the feedback loop, uh, then we can mimic or kind of represent your infinite impulse response system. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the time domain expression of an IAR filter. So the whole thing is to find out what your A's and B's are. Okay. So these are called the filter coefficients, A's and B's. Whereas an FIR filter, uh, because the finite impulse response we would have had as H. Now H is getting uh, two forms, A's and B's. Okay. Uh, now it's pretty obvious when we want to do the transfer function is nothing but doing the Z transform on Y N. If you do the transfer function of this IAR filter, uh, then we end up uh, in this expression H of Z, which is nothing but Y of Z divided by X of Z. The expression is uh, given here. Okay. So the A coefficients, which corresponds to uh the thing from uh, the input to the system uh, goes into the numerator and the b coefficients comes into the denominator okay and obviously the b coefficients are the one uh, that represents the feedback in the system 
So the feedback coefficients uh, uh, comes into the denominator. So we have uh, the IR filter coefficients A0 to AN and uh, B1 to BM. So these are the IR filter coefficients. Now, how do we find out these values? Okay. Previous example, we saw with finite impulse response, we used the windowing method to get the filter coefficients. Now, how do we get the IR filter coefficients A's and B's? Okay, is the key component here. Now, you got to remember, uh, this is a polynomial. It's, it's a form of numerator polynomial with denominator polynomial. And uh, it's pretty obvious the roots of the numerator polynomial will give the zeros of the system. And the denominator of the polynomial will give the poles of the system. So when you have a feedback uh, included, that means you are basically introducing poles in the system. Okay, that's exactly what's happening here. So we introduce a feedback into the whole process and that has given poles in the system. Okay. So IR filter uh, has both zeros and poles, uh, whereas an FIR system has only zeros. Okay, the denominator polynomials are seen to be one okay, in that case. So what are the uh, advantages of having an IR implementation? Okay. Uh, one of the main advantages is that uh, you can pretty much get uh, the filter characteristics that you want with fewer number of coefficients uh, compared to an FIR filter. Okay? Uh, for example, uh, we realized to, in, in the windowing method, when you want a sharper cutoff uh, of the FIR filter, we need to pick a higher order, which means more coefficients. Uh, whereas if you want to do the same thing, a similar cutoff with an IR filter, we need fewer coefficients. In other words, the number of uh, A's and B's we need will be fewer and having a fewer coefficients has a lot of advantages uh, in uh, signal processing and hardware implementation. Okay. Uh, the other advantage uh, of an IR filter is that uh, they give uh, a sharp cutoff. Okay. So if I want my uh, filter to have a sharp cutoff, uh, then IR filters are desirable. Uh, the simple reason we get a sharp cutoff with IR filters is because of the presence of the denominator polynomial and because of the presence of the poles in the system. Okay. And poles allows us to give the sharper cutoff. So uh, even in the case of an ideal low pass filter design, uh, we know an ideal low pass filter has infinite impulse response, but we have to truncate it somehow uh, and using the windowing method. When we truncate it, it becomes finite impulse response. And uh, how long we need to have the window duration has been a question and it depends on how much roll off or the attenuation we need, coming back to the previous example. Uh, in this case of IR filter, we don't have to be worried about those things, uh, what kind of window function needs to be selected, things like that, because the presence of poles uh, themselves provides a sharper cutoff. It's obvious because we have a feedback, any system where we have a feedback, it has to be carefully handled. And it goes back to your uh, previous knowledge in control systems. Uh, a feedback in the system has to be carefully handled because if we don't do a good job, you might end up in uh, making the system unstable. Okay. And this is uh, also possible in an IAR filter. In an infinite impulse response filter, it could become unstable because of the presence of the poles. And you got to be careful about the poles that you have to always keep the poles within the unit circle uh, to guarantee a stability. Okay, so uh, that's an important consideration. Whereas in case of FIR filters, we didn't have to be worry about that because it doesn't have poles, it only has zeros in the system. Okay. Now, we talked about uh, the advantages. Definitely, there are many advantages with IR design. Uh, and uh, now, how do we go about in finding these coefficients A's and B's that we talked about uh, is the next step. Okay? Uh, there are three methods uh, for IR filter design. Uh, and we will go through them uh, very quickly, the three methods of finding IR filter coefficients. Uh, whereas with FIR method, we only looked into windowing method, which is the most popular one. Uh, in the IAR method, the very first approach is uh, what's called the pole zero uh, placement method. Okay? So it is a natural extension of what we have seen so far, uh, and a first method of designing uh, your IAR filter using uh, poles and zeros. Okay? And you will see uh, it's much more of a, a formal approach in, in designing IAR filter uh, compared to what we have seen before, uh, where we found out that if you wanted to enhance a particular frequency, then you put poles in the unit circle or poles in the Z-plane. Uh, if you want to suppress 
a certain frequency, then we put a zero so right on the unit circle, that frequency will be eliminated. And that goes back to the uh, frequency response interpretation of H of Z. Okay. Now here, uh, with the pole zero placement in a more formal method, uh, we will use an example uh, to describe this method. So the consideration uh, here is for you to uh, design a notch filter. A notch filter, uh, as you understand, is a filter that removes a certain frequency. It's a, a special form of band stop filter. Here we wanted to remove a 50 hertz uh, uh, frequency and the bandwidth of that notch given is uh, 10 hertz. Okay. Now, how does this filter uh, looks like in the design is that uh, it has uh, this kind of a behavior. Okay. So this would be 50 hertz. So it's not a, a perfect notch at 50 hertz. It does have this kind of a V shape uh, at 50 hertz. Now, what does that V shape uh, tells us is that uh, basically we are looking at a bandwidth of uh, uh, 10 hertz. Now, how do we determine the bandwidth? It's 3 dB, okay? So we take the maximum one as uh, whatever, uh, some dB, then we go 3 dB below that. So this 3 dB line, when I draw it, uh, this corresponds to the bandwidth of the notch, okay? This is a 3 dB bandwidth. So this 3 dB bandwidth requirement is 10 hertz. So we want that to be 10 hertz, okay? So that's the design uh, consideration given. And you can uh, imagine that if you have a perfect uh, notch filter uh, that uh, with the bandwidth, the 3 dB bandwidth that we are talking would be zero hertz. It would be a, a sharp thing. But uh, here uh, the design specific that's provided is that uh, the notch frequency that we want to remove is 50 hertz and we wanted to make sure uh, the bandwidth of that notch is 10 hertz. Okay. Uh, so that's the design consideration that's been given uh, by the user and they feel uh, this notch filter would do the job uh, required for, for that application. Okay. Now, just I mentioned before, uh, in designing any digital systems, uh, you have to know the sampling frequency. So sampling frequency in this case has been given to be uh, 500 hertz. Okay. Now, how do we go about uh, in doing this is that uh, it's a very simple process. Okay. Now, we know what frequency to remove. And if you go back to your earlier understanding, if you want to remove a certain frequency, we place the zeros uh, at those specific points, okay? So uh, if you go back to the unit circle representation, uh, there's a Z plane and I have the unit circle representation. Uh, and we know from the unit circle representation that uh, uh, the frequency, uh, this is zero hertz, this is your DC frequency. Uh, this is a sampling frequency or once I make a two pi rotation, 500 hertz. So this would be uh, at pi, it would be 250 hertz. So these are the frequency labeling of that. So 50 hertz, uh, and this would be uh, like 125 hertz uh, at 90 degree angle. So 50 hertz would be, would be somewhere here, 50 hertz, okay? So what's expected uh, is that you would be placing two zeros at those two points. So you can remove the 50 hertz uh, frequency. So I would place one zero here, and by complex conjugate, because uh, as I indicated, poles and zeros always appear in complex conjugate pairs. I need to have the conjugate pair. Uh, the conjugate pair of this zero would be another zero there. Okay. Okay. So what's happening with this application is that uh, it's removing uh, 50 hertz, and by mirror image, uh, which is the second half of the spectrum, uh, normally it's also called negative frequency. If you see it in a different way, we are also removing 450 hertz. Okay. Uh, but the whole thing is that from the zero to 250 hertz, we are removing that 50 hertz frequency by placing the zeros right on the unit circle. This will do the job for us because we have seen before, if I want to get the frequency, the way we do is get the distance of uh, the point omega on the unit circle to the point zero. So this distance, uh, we have a some distance to start with. So the frequency response, if I were to plot it with our earlier understanding, is that there is some distance and as I go closer to 50 hertz, it dips. It starts to pick up again, and it goes like that, and it will dip again when it's 450 hertz, okay? But we are not interested in the second part of the spectrum. We are only interested in this part. So this is what we would have got, 50 hertz here, with our earlier understanding of going, tracing around the unit circle to get the frequency response going, okay? Now, we got to make it a little bit more formal because we do have a requirement that the bandwidth of this notch frequency that we are talking should be 10 hertz, okay? Okay, now going on a step further, uh, uh, 
Uh, you know the angle uh, uh, that we placed, the angle of uh, the zeros uh, is pretty obvious to measure because the entire angle is 2 pi, it should be 360 degrees. We know uh, 360 degree corresponds to the sampling frequency, which is 500 hertz. So if you want to know at what angle you need to place the zeros to remove the 50 hertz, uh, it's both plus or minus 36 degree angle. So the angle of this one, uh, the zero that we picked up, is 36 uh, degrees and minus 36 degree, or in other words, uh, it's a 2 pi minus uh, 36 degrees, okay? So that's the angle that we need to place the zeros. So just by knowing uh, this thing, we have picked up the location of the zeros, okay? The location of the zeros is given by this uh, formula, and uh, uh, that will allow us to remove uh, 50 hertz. Now, the next step is that, how do we control the bandwidth of that thing, which is the main requirement? And the bandwidth of this one, uh, as you know, uh, if you look into the uh, notch filter, maybe the notch filter we designed with the 50 hertz uh, placement of zeros would do something like that. And I have no control of this bandwidth. I could only control the bandwidth by pushing these frequencies, these pushing these frequencies uh, much more uh, narrower, uh, sharper like this. Okay? Now, how do I push a frequency? How do I enhance a frequency uh, at a certain point, like uh, the announcement that I'm talking is that uh, basically uh, pushing these uh, values of the roll up to have a much more sharper cutoff. Uh, if you want to push or in other words, amplify or enhance a frequency, then the concept of zeros, uh, sorry, poles comes into play, okay? So the idea is to place the poles somewhere closer to the zeros so you can get the bandwidth that you're looking for. Now, to facilitate that, we do have a formula of what should be the uh, of the uh, radius of the of the pole. You know, so it's clear. Uh, I wanted to enhance uh, certain frequencies closer to the notch, so I would place a, a, the the cross symbol denotes uh, poles. So it it has to be the same angle of the zeros. Okay, we should place the poles at thirty six degrees minus 36 degrees. But what comes uh, as a question is the radius of this uh, uh, pole. Okay. You cannot have the radius of the pole to be one because if you have the pole right on the unit circle, which is what the radius of one means, then the whole system will be uh, unstable because it's pole right on the unit circle and it will blow up the system. So we should place it closer to the unit circle and now we don't know what should be that radius. All we know is that the radius should be less than one. Okay. So this uh, formulation that I'm going to show allows us to get the radius of the pole. So to improve the sharpness of the uh, of the notch filter uh, so that it's much sharper, it's not uh, blunt like this, uh, it becomes much sharper uh, like this notch frequency and we satisfy the bandwidth requirement of uh, 10 hertz uh, for the given example. Uh, we need to make sure we do place uh, uh, poles. And the poles, just like the zeros, appear in conjugate pairs. And uh, the idea is that the radius of the pole should be uh, less than one. That's what makes the system stable. And also it makes sure uh, uh, that we get the bandwidth required. Now, what should be the radius of the pole is given by this formula, that the radius of the pole should be one minus bandwidth divided by the sampling frequency times pi. And in this particular example, uh, the bandwidth requirement, the bandwidth we needed for the notch filter was uh, 10 hertz. So when I plug in uh, those values, uh, I get the radius of the pole to be 0.937. Okay. So there you go. Now I got uh, the angle of the pole, which is 36 degrees and minus 36 degrees. And I got the radius of the pole to be 0.937. Once you have the magnitude uh, and the angle, then you can always construct uh, the expression because it's a complex number and you can construct the expression which is nothing but the transfer function of the filter. So the transfer function of the filter as you know is given by the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial. In the numerator polynomial we have uh, the zeros in the system. So in this case it would be z minus z1 uh, times the z minus z2 and in the denominator we have the poles which is not, nothing but z minus p1 uh, times z minus p2. We have zeros and poles. And zeros, we know the zero, uh, the angle of the zero is uh, minus, uh, sorry, plus and minus 36 degrees. And the radius of the zeros is one because the zeros are placed exactly on the unit circle 
and having zeros on the unit cycle doesn't do anything to the stability. So the numerator expression is what's shown here. So z minus uh, z1, z minus z2 is nothing but z minus exponential, uh, which is nothing but the angle of the uh, zero uh, and uh, the complex conjugates angle. Now in the denominator, uh, obviously the pole one uh, is at the same angle uh, as the zero, no problem. But the radius of the pole uh, was calculated to enable that uh, transition width or the bandwidth we are looking for. So the radius of the pole is given by 0.937 and that's what I plug in the denominator. So by using this expression, now we can expand this uh, numerator polynomial and denominator polynomial. When I do the expansion of the numerator polynomial, this is what I get for the numerator. Uh, and when I do a similar expansion of the denominator, uh, this is what uh, we get for the denominator. So the transfer function of this given uh, IAR filter uh, turns out to be uh, of this form, okay, H of Z. So this is obvious. Now uh, I can uh, convert this uh, Z transform into a difference equation uh, just by doing the inverse uh, Z transform. And inverse Z transform, you don't have to be worried about how to do inverse Z transform. Uh, it's obvious because uh, what happens is that the, uh, the, if Z transform of X of N is X of Z, uh, the Z transform of X of N minus one uh, would be Z minus uh, one uh, X of Z. So by using the simple uh, expression of the inverse Z transform is good enough to do this kind of filter transfer function. So here we have H of Z, which is given by this expression. So I have Y of Z divided by X of Z equal to this expression. So I would be multiplying uh, Y of Z by this denominator value and X of Z by this numerator value. And when I do the inverse Z transform, then I can get the difference equation, difference equation of the time domain expression of this one, okay? So this time domain expression tells me uh, this is the uh, difference equation of the IAR system, okay? Now, if I look into this more carefully, uh, I got my A's and B's that I was looking for, okay? In other words, A is zero, which is the first coefficient of Xn is one, A1 equal to negative 1.6180. Uh, my a2 equal to 1. Uh, so that's my coefficient that corresponds to the things that I get from my input xn. Now the coefficients of uh, b, so the b1 here would be uh, 1.5161 and uh, b2 would be, so that should be a plus sign here. Okay, B2 equal to uh, 0.8878. So this is what we wanted. Okay, this is exactly are my filter coefficients of the given IAR system where I wanted to remove 50 hertz frequency with the bandwidth of that 50 hertz notch uh, filter being 10 hertz. Uh, with that, I got these coefficients. So this is a realization of an infinite impulse response filter and it goes back into what we just uh, discussed in the beginning. Uh, and all we were looking at in the beginning is that, how do we really get uh, uh, these coefficients? Okay, so this is what uh, the IAR uh, formulation looks like. This is not realizable, but now we went through an example and we got our A's and B's determined uh, through the process of pole zero method. Okay, pole zero method. Okay. So, this is a neat example of uh, uh, designing a practical IAR filter. In fact, in your uh, lab too, you will be designing a similar type of filter uh, to remove the 60 Hertz interference uh, from the ECG signal. So the ECG signal given to you is obtained from a clinical instrumentation system where it hasn't gone through any filtering process. It has uh, 60 Hertz power line interference, uh, as I indicated, uh, power line interferences uh, play a significant role in physiological uh, signal acquisition. It has to be removed. So that 60 Hertz interference is present in the ECG given to you, along with uh, some uh, instrumentation noise, which is uh, random, okay? So your lab too is entirely about filtering those noises out, okay? When you're filtering out, uh, it has to be uh, as sharp as possible for example, if you don't design according to the criteria given and you are basically designing a notch filter, which looks like this, 
in that case what's happening is that in addition to removing the notch frequency it's removing a lot of frequencies which just adjacent to the notch frequency which means uh, in an ecg you might be removing important information that's present in a qrs complex okay so that's why the bandwidth of the notch becomes so important that we have to be as precise as possible in ensuring that we remove the frequency that's exactly needed to be removed and we don't do much damage to the adjacent frequencies because it might contain information of relevance clinically and otherwise okay uh, so you will get to feel this uh, through the lab to experiment in matlab where you would be designing an iar filter uh, using pole zero method uh, to enhance the signal uh, by removing uh, 60 hertz power line interference and also uh, random noise okay so that's uh, the first method uh, and one of the very common methods of iar filter design uh, by using pole zero placement the two other methods of iar filter design uh, and that it's not a, essentially a digital filter design concept by itself what happens is that the filters uh, could be designed very nicely in the analog domain okay by using uh, rlc circuits uh, you can design nice filters in the analog domain uh, but analog filter design as you realize are very sensitive uh, to the changes in the values because of uh the instability of the uh the physical aspects like the capacitors inductors and resistors are prone uh, to external uh, uh, changes okay so now how do we use uh, the great designs available in analog filters uh, to realize them in the digital world are the next two methods of ir filter design uh, so one of the other methods of ir filter design is the impulse invariant method and the concept is pretty simple and straightforward all we do is that we design an analog filter which as i said are easy to do and quite uh, numerically uh, convenient uh, but implementation or realization of that might be difficult that's not an issue for us because we are trying to realize the filter in the digital domain but we could convert those analog filters to digital filter okay uh so as i indicated uh the classical ways of designing analog filter has been well known for many years uh, and there are four common methods okay uh, one is the butterworth method uh, butterworth way of designing filter butterworth filters uh, uh, tend to have a very good uh, pass band behavior uh, and also very good stop band behavior okay when i say monotonic it means uh, when i design the filter in the pass band it will be more or less like this okay uh, so this is a pass band it doesn't have a lot of ripples it's more or less flat and also in the stop band it's flat but maybe it may not give a, a, a sharp uh, cut off it may not give a sharp cut off okay uh, the cut off might be a bit rolled off okay in the butterworth uh, whereas a chebyshev filters uh, have a very good uh, monotonic behavior that behavior as something like this in in the pass band but they have a lot of ripples uh, in the stop band so the stop band will have a lot of ripples okay that's what happens with a chebyshev 1 uh, chebyshev 2 does the other way uh, it has more ripples in the pass band and it has monotonic behavior in the stop band okay uh, elliptic uh, has ripples both in the pass band and stop band but it might be able to give us a sharper cut off okay so these are a uh, well known classical designs of filters in the analog domain uh, with uh, characteristics represented by flat response or monotonic response uh, uh, in the stop band or the pass band and ripples in the stop band or pass band okay uh, and vice versa so ripples is basically a more like a, a ringing effect in the frequency domain so what i have plotted the stop band and pass band are obviously in the frequency domain characterization of the analog filters so these are uh, four well known uh, analog filter designs uh, can give uh, good performances now how do we take these analog filters and digital filters uh, is uh, uh, through this block diagram process that i'm showing here so we have the analog filters uh, designed uh, in, in one of the four ways as described before and analog filters mathematically are given by h of s okay 
uh, analog filters uh, hfs because they are represented by uh, in the s domain by laplace transform okay so we do an inverse laplace transform and we get hft so what the hft we got is the impulse response of the analog filter uh, uh, in the analog domain or the continuous domain okay hft here hft okay analog or continuous domain now we know when you have a continuous function we could make it discrete by sampling that's exactly what we are doing so we are sampling and now we get a discrete impulse response which is what we have been using throughout uh, the digital concepts so this could also be called h of n because t is the sampling time so it could be called h of n now i got the impulse response that i'm looking for my digital filter now i can just do the z transform of that uh, and get my digital filter design okay so it's a form of mapping from your analog transfer function h of s to the digital transfer function h of z okay so it's basically going through the process of converting h of s to h of t by inverse laplace transform then discretizing that h of t using sampling to get your h n a discrete impulse response now h of n when i do the z transform i get h of z okay so pretty neat idea and concept and only thing you need to keep in mind is that we know we can do only sampling on the band limited uh, signal okay the signal should have a limited bandwidth so it's uh, two types of filters which has limited bandwidth are low pass filter and band pass filters they have a limited bandwidth a high pass filter it does not have a limitation of the bandwidth because it passes any frequency above a certain cut off okay it doesn't have a limited bandwidth so this method two of impulse invariant method works very well uh, for uh, both lpf and hpf design uh, sorry lpf and uh, vpf band pass filter design because they have limited bandwidth and they do not do a, anything for high pass filter or band stuff filter design because they don't have a limited bandwidth when you don't have a limited bandwidth sampling doesn't work uh, because sampling needs as you know uh, twice the bandwidth or twice the maximum frequency present the nyquist criteria uh, it doesn't apply to high pass or band stuff filter so this is uh, a good design process if you are just interested in lpf and vpf uh, designs the impulse invariant method okay uh, okay so that's a very simple and efficient method two now method three uh, is probably the most common way uh, people use uh, for ir filter design these days okay and that's called the bilinear uh, z transform method uh, method three and it's uh, abbreviated as bzt bzt okay bilinear z transform uh, some books call it as blt as well okay Uh, i would uh, use a bzt uh, in the in the description here uh, and what does it imply it's again similar to what we saw with method 2 uh, this is a, a design which also takes advantage of the analog filters okay analog filters as we just saw is represented by h of s and uh, it's in the laplace plane okay so uh, so in the analog domain we have in the laplace domain Uh, I got called H of S, and in the Laplace uh, domain, uh, going back into your uh, previous uh, knowledge about this Laplace transform, uh, it does have a real and imaginary axis, and the real axis corresponds to uh, uh, sigma, and the imaginary axis uh, has the j omega thing. Okay, and here the omega uh, is an analog frequency. Okay, in other words, continuous frequencies. I will no donate by omega one to differentiate it from. the omega that we see in the uh, digital domain or the z transform domain uh, on the right side uh, i have shown you the z plane where we can get h of z okay so on the left side is h of z the continuous or the analog domain plane on the right side is what shows the uh, z domain uh, or the uh, digital domain okay now these two transformations were developed independently okay laplace uh, transform was developed a long time ago uh, obviously by uh, laplace uh, to understand uh, differential equations and differential equations uh, in the time domain uh, translates into h of s in the laplace domain okay but a z transform was developed uh, in the early 20th century uh, by professors in california berkeley 
uh, where uh, they were dealing with the discrete systems and discrete systems are represented by difference equation and that's what we said difference equation is the uh, discrete equivalent of a differential equations so difference equation in the time domain uh, could be converted uh, uh, by using z transform in the digital domain okay so they were developed independently but they have connectivity the connectivity is what uh, the diagram is showing so i have this uh, uh, shaded lines on the left hand plane and let me pick uh, 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 the green color uh, for the things on the left hand so here i have these lines which are on the left hand side of the s plane okay and if you go back into your uh, laplace domain concept you were asked to design a system where you would prefer uh, to have your poles on the uh, left hand side okay and what happens uh, of that left hand side is that this green region essentially gets mapped into within the unit circle in the z plane that's a mapping of it okay so what was said as on the left hand side of uh, the laplace domain maps into within the unit circle for the z plane okay z plane now the second idea is if we wanted to operate on the imaginary axis or the y axis okay of your uh, laplace domain and this is a uh, uh just a representation of few uh, poles by the way for poles we use uh, the multiplication symbol and for zeros we use uh, the circle uh, okay the o uh, notation so here i am just taking an example of some poles being on the imaginary axis or the j omega 1 axis now you can see equivalent of this one of the imaginary axis is the unit circle on the z plane unit circle of the z plane so essentially what's happening is that your imaginary axis gets mapped into the unit circle in the z plane okay. so we realized the importance of unit circle z plane similarly the j omega 1 or the imaginary axis in the laplace domain is also an important consideration okay. now the other one that's left is the right hand side of your laplace plane or the s plane Uh, left the right hand side uh, i am denoting by this horizontal lines are on the right hand side plane now what happens is that this right hand side of the uh, s plane gets mapped into outside the unit circle in the z plane so this is a great one to one mapping of your s plane and z plane one to one mapping so what has happened is that anything that was on the left hand side of your uh, s plane gets mapped within the unit circle anything on the imaginary axis of your s plane gets mapped to the unit circle itself on the z plane on anything on the right hand side of the s plane gets mapped into uh, outside the unit circle in the z plane okay now we know this is a nice nice connection between uh, both laplace and z transform if you can go back one further step on the imaginary axis my s is equal to j omega 1 okay whereas on the unit circle my z equal to e power j omega that's a unit circle because the magnitude is uh, unity and it has a phase of omega so this is a special case we know unit circle and imaginary axis special case and these special cases if you observe closely and if you plug into the mathematical expression both for laplace which is s equal to j omega and also when you plug into z equal to e power j omega for uh, z transform of it then you will realize both those things uh, correspond to the special case that i'm talking is that these are fourier transforms fourier transforms so this is a, a nice diagram which connects all these transformations together okay we just saw the mapping from s plane to z plane laplace plane to z plane now we when we made a special case that s equal to imaginary axis it gave us fourier transform and in this case we call it continuous fourier transform okay when s is equal to j omega when you make z equal to e j omega we also get the fourier transform but it's a discrete fourier transform 
Got the point. So the moment we, uh, we calculate the Fourier transform on the unit circle uh, in the Z plane, that corresponds to the discrete Fourier transform or DFT. When we compute the Fourier transform along the imaginary axis in the S plane, it becomes a, a continuous Fourier transform. So these, all those things which you are seeing in, in the basic signals and system are all coming together through this just very nice one snapshot representation of the different planes. Okay. And they were all developed independently, by the way. You know, uh, Laplace Z, uh, continuous Fourier transform and discrete Fourier transform were all developed independently. But on the computer, what we are essentially realizing is a discrete Fourier transform. Because the concept of continuous Fourier transform doesn't apply in, on computers. So the discrete Fourier transform implementation when you see in uh, languages like MATLAB or other programming environment is what's called the fast Fourier transform. It's basically making a faster implementation of the discrete Fourier transform is called FFT as the fast Fourier transform. Okay. So what we are essentially doing is that we are going around the unit circle in discrete points and getting the uh, FFT going, fast Fourier transform going. And it will become even more clearer as the course goes by on the practical implementation of what we are seeing here. Okay. Now you might ask the point, uh, what was shown so far was more a diagrammatic representation of the connection between your uh, S domain and Z domain. Now, how does it look mathematically is through this expression here. Okay. So if you just make the substitution, S equal to K times Z minus one by Z plus one, then mathematically you are connecting the two domains. Okay. Now K is nothing but a constant. Uh, you could either use it one, or you could use it two over uh, t, where t is the sampling time. And as you know, when we deal with any uh, digital system, we need to be mindful of the sampling uh, rate or the sampling time. There, okay? So this simple formula, which is nothing but a constant times z minus one by z plus one, allows us to map uh, s plane to z plane. So it's not as just a straightforward uh, mapping. It, it does go through uh, a numerator and a denominator uh, expressions here, which is z minus one and z plus one, allows us to uh, take advantage of this mapping. Okay. So given that, now uh, the idea is, is how do we design H of z? Okay. The given idea is that because the whole point is to design an IAR digital filter. Now, what is H of z? And we know we have good filters from analog domain H of s. We have good filters there. Now, by using this substitution formula, we can go from H of Z to H of Z and also vice versa if you want, okay? So just by using a direct substitution into that uh, will not be a, a desirable outcome is that uh, this expression that uh, I showed you before is what it's doing is that also you can appreciate uh, to some extent from the point of uh, the graphical representation, especially when we consider this imaginary axis, you can see this imaginary axis uh, is going uh, infinite uh, duration, okay? It's infinity, minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? That's what uh, this uh, imaginary axis is doing for us. But when this imaginary axis gets mapped to unit circle, it gets wrapped, it gets confined into a, a circle, okay? So this mapping you can appreciate is not uh, doing that linear one-to-one -one transformation we are looking for. Something that was infinity has been confined into a unit circle uh, that uh, we see in the Z plane. Now, what happens uh, to the individual frequencies is that uh, along the imaginary axis and also to the individual frequencies along the unit circle is that it goes through this uh, uh, mapping. So if this is my digital frequency, which I get in the Z plane on the X axis, and if this is my analog frequency, uh, which I get through Laplace, uh, if I put it on the on the y axis, so this is s domain. This mapping is not a linear line; it goes through this non-linear line uh, mapping. Okay. So what happens is that if you plan to design a filter, uh, a digital filter, uh, which is at 50 hertz, the analog equivalent is not exactly 50 hertz; it might be 60 hertz because of this curve. It's not a line anymore. If it was a linear line, yes. A 50 hertz uh, filter that I'm looking in the digital domain could come from a 50 hertz filter from an analog domain. But because of this non-linearity, it's introducing this distortion. Now this distortion could also be mathematically represented 
And that's nothing but when we just use the simple substitution of these values into the uh, expression that I showed you before, uh, this expression, it happens that uh, the connection between your analog frequency uh, omega one and the digital frequency omega uh, is uh, tangential. It has a, a, a tan function associated with it. And this is a simple nonlinear curve. Now, what you could do is that if you wanted to avoid this kind of uh, a distortion, we can do something called uh, pre-warping. Okay? So a pre-warping is an idea uh, where if before we start to design the digital filter from the analog filter, we make sure the analog filter uh, response is being uh, pre-warped. Okay? Then when we use the, uh, the bilinear Z-transform expression I just showed you, then you will get a linear relationship between the two frequencies. So how do we do this? Is that this pre-warping frequency is nothing given by tangential relationship with, with the uh, original frequency. Okay. So by using the substitution, so let's say if I wanted to design a, a, a low pass filter, then I would be substituting my S by S over uh, this pre-warped frequency. Okay. Omega P1, which is nothing but uh, the expression that's given uh, just above it. Okay. So instead of just uh, going from HF S directly to HF Z, I would make the substitution HF S equal to S by omega P1, do that substitution and then go to HF Z, which will ensure the relationship between my analog and digital frequencies are linear in nature. Okay, so this is a substitution I need to do before I convert to digital domain for low pass to low pass conversion. And it's also easy to go from low pass to high pass design. Okay, so if you want to go from a low pass analog filter to a, a high pass equivalent of that, you do this kind of a substitution, which is similar to the expression above, but it's flipped. Okay, and from a low pass to band pass, you go through this substitution. Okay, so these are all derived versions of it, uh, and uh, also to de derive this expression s equal to. Uh, 2 over t by z minus 1 by z plus 1. How did we get that? Uh, you can always uh, use a simple uh, analog filter, uh, like analog filter is represented by Laplace domain by this expression. Uh, it has a, a differential equation version of it, which is nothing but the inverse Laplace transform of it. Now, if you look into this expression more closely, uh, I am trying to now convert this continuous time into discrete time because you know uh, anything that's a derivation. Uh, could also be seen um, through the uh, summation process, uh, especially uh, something, uh, this expression that's above could be represented by what's called the trapezoidal uh, formula. Trapezoidal formula is just a mathematical way of breaking your differential equations or your, your integration into parts, okay? your parts. When we break things into parts, then by just a natural progression of what's uh, Given that mathematically we can show, we can go through this fully and mathematically we can show that at the end uh, you get this uh, formula. Okay? So I don't expect uh, you to again uh, know how we got uh, this bilinear Z-transform formula. Uh, uh, it's just for you to know that is a very simple uh, mathematics where you can start from a differential equation then go through the process of what's called the trapezoidal sum uh, in other words, summation by parts. When we do this thing, then we can find out uh, mathematically that S and Z are connected through this expression of bilinear Z transform. Okay. Now, given these things, uh, uh, I think uh, we will just go through a few examples to validate the concepts further uh, because the method tree, uh, the bilinear Z transform method is pretty simple. It's just uh, going from H of S uh, to H of Z by making the substitution S equal to uh, what's given here. Okay? And if you see this expression, it could be written also as Z minus one by Z plus one. Okay, both are similar type of expression. And this uh, relates to the constant that we have seen. So it's also K uh, Z minus one by Z plus one. Okay, both formula are acceptable. K is a constant, which could be one or uh, two over T, uh, depending on the application, but the constant doesn't have a lot of influence. Okay. Okay, so this formula uh, could also be used uh, for your third method of uh, IR filter design. And 
just like how we did with method two, we have used uh, the advantages that we have with uh, your uh, analog filters and taken those analog filters into the digital domain uh, by using the bilinear uh, Z uh, mapping of it. Okay? Uh, so these three methods of IR filter design uh, could be used interchangeably depending on your design uh, specifications that are given to you. Okay? Pole zero method, impulse invariant method, and bilinear Z uh, transform method. We will see a few examples, uh, numerical examples on how things are done. And this should allow you to get the concept even more uh, firmer. Okay, so you will be able to appreciate uh, what we are talking here. So with that being said, you, you can imagine uh, uh, eventually that uh, we would be able to connect uh, the various uh, domains continuous domain, discrete domain uh, with uh, frequency response in the continuous and, and also in the discrete through all those uh, transformations are coming unified and they're coming together. Z transform, your Laplace transform ideas and Fourier transform are all coming together uh, to really uh, make you understand uh, what we could do with the filtering concepts, okay? So the filtering, uh, so far what we have seen uh, it's normally uh, thought of as uh, a process to remove uh, certain noises and interferences. Uh, but you could also imagine uh, the filtering as something that's naturally done by your uh, body. Okay? Uh, we know that some of uh, the techniques available out there, you can sense, uh, for example, the cardiac pulse at the wrist level. Okay? So you can put a, a sensor at the wrist and you can get a nice uh, pulse, arterial pulse, uh, which could represent the cardiac activity. When you look into the whole system, we know from the cardiac functioning, okay, uh, the action of the ventricles, when the ventricles are contracting, it's giving you a dominant peak in the form of a QRS complex. And that QRS complex, when it's propagated through the iota through the uh, and through the arteries and we sense those things at the wrist level then you're basically getting some form of filtered version of your QRS. Okay. So what's happening at the heart it could be your input signal x the QRS complex and what you're detecting uh, at your wrist level let's say with an watch a smartwatch could be seen as y and you could see that entire conduction system as a filter. Okay. So just to give an idea of that um, so uh, going back into the diagram uh, of your uh, X and Y. So th this could be the ventricle uh, contraction and it could be uh, probably your, your ECG right at the chest level. And we know that you get this nice uh, QRS complex there. Uh, it could be seen as X. And let's assume this is uh, at the chest level and at the wrist level where a lot of wearable devices these days are measuring heart rate and heart rate variability at the wrist level because it's easy to access compared to chest uh, being the access point all the time. And what you see is, is uh, some kind of a, a, a pulse there. Okay? So what's happened is that uh, your QRS complex uh, at the ECG has been converted into some form of a modified pulse at the wrist level through the system H. Okay? And this is a conduction system right from your uh, heart to the wrist level, okay? I'm modeling the whole system as a H. Now, this is nothing but some form of filtering has happened to your input source to give my output uh, Y, okay? So something has happened here. Uh, yes, I can easily point that out uh, by X and uh, it has gone through this H and got Y. So this is not something uh, we designed. The H was given naturally to us. But the same thing applies here. The same ideas which we saw applies here. I could also build a transfer function here where the transfer function H of Z will connect my two waveforms, uh, both at the wrist level and at the chest level. So this is where the filtering idea need not be always uh, made or designed by human. Uh, we could also start to look into physiological systems also as some form of a, a natural filter. It may not behave uh, the exact way we want because obviously uh, we were not designed to follow certain uh, rigorous 
mathematical representations, but it's just a tool for us to give a high level approximation idea of what's going on. The same concept which I plotted with QRS and on the wrist could be applied to any physiological signal, okay? Uh, and I can go one step further, and we know uh, you get your QRS because of uh, the things that you get from your action potential. So if I represent my action potential, uh, summation of my action potential, for example, uh, as a, another signal, in, in this case, I would call the, uh, that signal uh, for the sake of convenience, let me call it as a, a P. Okay, uh, just for sake of uh, understanding P uh, variable. And just like how we showed before, the P is entering uh, through some form of a, a system to give you a QRS complex. And this system, uh, I could also call it as a, a impulse response, let's call H1, uh, just to be different from H. Now, the whole thing has changed here, you know, so the input to this system has become, uh, P has become the input to the system and X has become the output to the system. And here again, uh, it has gone through a filtering process. So the action potential, which are coming at the cellular level, uh, because of the summation of the various uh, cardiac myocytes, uh, has generated an input signal P. That input signal P has gone through some form of a physiological filtering H1 to give your ECG QRS complex, uh, which we denote as X. So this is again a system of systems. So you could see the human body is a cascade of these different systems. I can break this whole thing into two systems here. So from action potential, uh, we got the QRS complex through a system H1. And from QRS complex, I got my pulse at the risk level uh, through another system H. Okay. So have we understood this process fully? Not really. This is where we are borrowing the tools that we know from our signals and systems concept to understand the process as much as possible. Uh, because if you wanted to understand why certain things have changed or uh, things have become abnormal, it's that we will be zooming into the behavior uh, of uh, these two uh, guys. Okay, the behavior of H1 and the behavior of H, this is a thing that we have more control. We don't have any control on action potential that we generated naturally. We do not have any contraction of QRS complex or all the pulse that's uh, sensed at the wrist level, but we do uh, have some idea on how to analyze your H and H1, uh, which are nothing but the transfer function or to be specific, uh, the response of the system. Okay? Uh, so let's keep that in mind that, that filtering ideas uh, also is happening naturally and we are trying to understand uh, whether your system is behaving in a low pass, high pass, or a band pass way, which we don't know yet, and uh, it depends on the context. So this example, which I showed with uh, action potential QRS and pulse at the risk level, uh, could also be expanded to EEG signals. It could be an EMG or any physiological signals. Uh, but let me assure you, there are a lot of gaps uh, that people have to understand and fill the knowledge gap there. Uh, it's uh, really an exciting area. Uh, study for us. Okay, uh, with this uh, we will take a break, and when we come back, we will look into numerical examples of doing uh, the two methods of IR design: uh, impulse invariant method and bilinear Z-transfer method. That will further reinforce uh, the concepts uh, and the equations that we have seen so far. Okay, thank you. <laughs>